What to move the adjournment? Big move this house to now adjourn. Question is this house to now adjourn. George Galloway. Speaker, a government ready to rely on those friends of liberty, the Democratic Unionist Party, to shred the liberties of our own people is almost by definition unembarrassable. But I hope this evening to add to the issues ventilated in a recent Channel 4 dispatches program to adumbrate the extent to which the tragedy in Somalia, which so many people are now becoming aware of, is another of our government's dirty little secrets. We must start the story in Ethiopia, where four million people, according to the United Nations, are facing starvation, and where 120,000 Ethiopian children have just one month to live, according to last week's media reports. Television viewers were shocked to see the pictures last week about the widespread suffering redolent of 1984 and the great famine of that year. The US and Britain immediately pledged $90 million in famine relief. Just one week after its appeal to the international community for famine relief, the Ethiopian government increased its military budget by $50 million to $400 million. The regime in Addis Ababa, when I knew them in the 1980s, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they were pro-Albanian Maoists, is the most militarized and heavily armed in Africa. It is in a state of perpetual war or preparation for war with one neighbor, Eritrea. It is supporting anti-government rebels with Western connivance, many believe, in Sudan. But most astonishing of all, the government of Ethiopia, this starving country whose little children, fly infested, kwashior core swollen, famished, famine stricken children, has been encouraged, armed, trained, financed and otherwise facilitated to invade and occupy its neighbour Somalia and create a reign of terror in that land which is testified to by this voluminous Amnesty International report which if I had time I would extensively quote from. Somalia has lost thousands of dead as a result of the Ethiopian invasion. Millions have been displaced. Somalia under Ethiopian occupation is the grimmest prison state in Africa. Worse, far worse than Mugabe's Zimbabwe. And who has done the encouraging, the arming, the training, the financing and the facilitating? The same US and British governments who donated the $90 million to the same Ethiopian government which is burning its money and burning the villages, the neighborhoods and the people of occupied Somalia. This government is never done talking about the shortcomings of African leaders. Just last week in Rome, the Secretary of State for International Development was roaring at Robert Mugabe. Yet there has not been a squeak out of him or any other minister about the much bigger crime in which we are ourselves deeply complicit. Is it any wonder that African opinion considers so much of what we have to say about misgovernance in Africa to be the deepest, most cynical hypocrisy? Two weeks ago, Channel 4's dispatches team took terrifying risks to bring us the latest from occupied Mogadishu. It was undoubtedly an award-winning documentary. It was memorable for many reasons, not least the scene in the FCO when the minister, Lord Malik Brown, his face frozen in horror, was confronted by Adam Hartley with the central case of the documentary makers which for those members who didn't see it, I know that the minister will have seen it. She could hardly be sent out to bat on this wicket without being shown it, was this, that in the grim prison state of occupied Somalia, the fingerprints of our country and our government 
are all over the scene of the crime. The president of the puppet regime imposed by the Ethiopian army in Somalia turns out to be British. He spends much of his time here. Well, it's dangerous in Somalia after all. He has property here, family here. He presides over a gang of torturers, murderers, grand larceners, extortionists, and then flies back to England. The police chief, whose police officers kidnap people for ransom, which they extort from people living in our own country, in Leicester, in Birmingham, in London. His police officers torture people. They make them disappear. They kill them if their families will not pay. He's British too, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And the former Interior Minister, who presides over an interior of mass refugee camps, starvation and misery, and who stands accused of stealing international aid, of diverting food for political purposes, why he also is British. And guess what? Who is paying the wages of the murdering, kidnapping, torturing, quizzling police force in Ethiopian-occupied Somalia? That's right, we are. The puppet dictatorship in Somalia is a very British crime, especially as our own government, especially the pocket-sized Palmerston, the Secretary of State hitherto referred to, is so very voluble on other problems in Africa. So how did we get here? How did we get into bed with the former pro-Albanian Maoists of the government in Addis Ababa? I'm afraid it's our old friend, our old acquaintance. The policy of my enemy's enemy is my friend. This policy which has put us in so much trouble from Afghanistan to Iraq and many other parts of the world is what lies behind this obscene paradox. We are supporting the Ethiopian government's occupation of Somalia because George Bush told us to. Because Somalia is a front line in George Bush's ill-conceived, counterproductive, utterly discredited, about to be booted out in the United States, so-called war on terror. We are against the former government of Somalia because it was an Islamic government. Just as we're against the government in Sudan because it's an Islamic government. Just as Ethiopia on our behalf opposes the government in Eritrea because it's an Islamic government. This policy, having been such a disaster around the world, is now in full force in Somalia. And but for Channel 4's dispatches, hardly anyone in Britain would know anyone about it. No minister has come to the dispatch box to explain why British taxpayers' money is being paid to a police force in Mogadishu, which is accused of kidnapping people and extorting the money for the ransom from British citizens. No British government minister has come to explain, unless one takes Lord Malach Brown's frozen face as explanation, why we are so heavily involved with a puppet regime bereft of political and public support in Somalia. This policy, Mr. Deputy Speaker, of backing anyone that Bush tells us to, this policy of backing anyone who is against those which we today perceive ourselves to be against is morally, utterly vacuous, but arguably worse than that. It's not only morally vacuous, it's a total dismal failure, as we found in Afghanistan to our bitter, bitter cost, not least this very week. The very mujahids that Mrs. Thatcher's government lauded and supported and armed are now murdering and killing our soldiers oh, oh, in Afghanistan. Oh, oh, oh. I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. To George Galloway. I had the adjournment debate. It was scheduled to start at 7 o'clock for half an hour. It, I've now had 10 minutes and the country of those interested watching on Parliament TV will not hear the Minister even reply. The was misunderstood. The adjournment debate is now starting at 7 o'clock. He so far had bonus time. 
it's one of the systems we have to go through as far as the House is concerned. Well, that's truly magnificent, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, I have plenty to say, perhaps I can now quote from Amnesty International in more detail in the time that I didn't think I'd have available. The point is, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this policy is not only morally bankrupt, it is also politically disastrous. Afghanistan is the perfect case in point, and Ethiopia, which is presiding, the Ethiopian government presiding over a country where now famine and mass starvation stops the land, is being helped militarily to invade and occupy its neighbors and threaten other of its neighbors. What can this conceivably do for our standing in Africa?